we help SMEs firstly to find suitable advisors to help with their business issues and then we help them with the cost of those advisory services through our subsidy scheme. So all BLP approved advisors go through a quality assurance process and that includes both a due diligence process and a competency assessment and that's to verify that they do in fact have the skills and experience they need to be able to provide really high quality advice. That way SMEs can be confident in the services they receive from BLP. Um, now we take this approach of working with business advisory firms because we know that businesses do so much better when they access professional advice rather than working on their own. Um, now this particular slide shows the countries that BLP works in and um, since, uh, since then we've also started working in Kiribati and Tonga and at the moment we're really encouraging business advisors in these particular countries to register with us as we build up our networks in um, Kiribati and Tonga. We have in-country representatives in each of our countries, our business service managers or BSMs, they're locally based and their role is to support both SMEs and advisors with accessing BLP services. So BLP services include our SME hub where SMEs can find a toolkit of online business diagnostic tools such as the business health check, the business continuity planner, finance finder, various tools that help SMEs to identify area where they, areas where they may need some support. And actually very soon we'll be um, also launching our export readiness tool, which will be particularly useful after this webinar. Um, and um, we also have, of course, the finance facility, which helps provide access to finance through um, the BLP adaptation grants, concessionary lending and subsidies for advisory services. Now, currently applications are open for the second round of the BLP adaptation grants. Um, so really worthwhile going and having a look on our portal about um, that opportunity. Um, applications will remain open until the 27th of July, so I do urge you to check out um, just uh, whether or not you can apply for one of those. Really great opportunity. Um, we also have a range of other support services and support mechanisms, including professional development initiatives for advisors. Uh, and those services, of course, incorporate this webinar series, our podcast series, as well as customised professional development services um, to support business advisors' development. Um, so there's more, more information on professional development services on the portal. And, of course, you'll find out much more on our portal, as well as um, you can hear about BLP on LinkedIn and Facebook. So that's a little bit about um, BLP. Um, and um, in terms of our progress, well, we've now got over 130 approved advisory firms or partners that we work with, over 160 individual advisors who are approved by BLP, and we also have a growing network of SMEs, um, of which over 800 have received subsidies um, for advisory services so far. Um, our online business tools are being well utilised and as a result of all of these services, uh, we've worked out that more than 400 new jobs have been created uh, within our networks, 40% um, of which have been taken up by women. So that's um, very pleasing to see. Um, and that's a little bit of information about BLP and our progress so far. So... Um, I'd now like to introduce you to our guest today. So Gautam Kishore is EIF's Business Development Manager for the Pacific Islands. He's based in Auckland. Um, EIF also has offices in Fiji though. Um, now Gautam, he's been working in logistics for about 15 years or so. He's got a, an MBA from the Fiji National University and he's worked for the Fijian Revenue and Customs Department. He's worked for um, PASS Aviation as well as EIF. Um, so he's very well acquainted with exporting in the Pacific. Gautam, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome along. It's great having you here and um, you know, really looking forward to hearing more about exporting and, and, and what you do. Perhaps um, I can ask you to start off by telling us a little bit about your, your role and your company and the, the services that you offer in the Pacific. Okay, thank you, Barbara, and uh, thank you to BLP for allowing EIF to be part of this uh, webinar. And it's, I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, Bula to everyone. Uh, basically, I'll brief about myself. So I'm from Fiji, basically born in Reiki Reiki, and moved to New Zealand about five years ago. 
and have been working for EIF International for the last three years. Uh, brief on EIF, 17 years ago, uh, EIF was established by two uh, two sisters. So our current directors are two ladies, uh, Anne Mary and Joe. Uh, we have a facility or operations in Oakland, a operation in Melbourne and two offices in Fiji. Our range of operations or services we provide in the Pacific Islands or probably a global service we provide throughout the region is uh, both ARC freight and modern day warehousing, which we call it 3PL services. We have about 50 staffs in Oakland, about 10 staffs in Melbourne and about 10 to 12 staffs in, in Fiji, basically in Lotoka and Suva. And Basic, and other services we provide in Oakland is custom screens, which is helping importers and exporters bringing and exporting or basically importing and exporting goods out and in into New Zealand. Uh, we provide warehousing and distribution. So we have a 3PL warehouse, which we can cater 22,000 per position of general goods, uh, MPI certification, ATF facility, which is uh, approvals for grains, coffee beans, timber, uh, general food, etc. So, yep, we have been here for 18 years. Uh, my current role with EIF is I'm the business development manager for the Pacific Islands. I manage or overlook all the operations we provide to the Pacific Islands from Fiji to um, Guam, which is the uh, USA territory. And I think it's unfortunate to be part of this and happy to help anyone who's looking for any services into Oakland or within the region. Wow, that's that's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. That, um, that's a really good uh, overview of your your company and, and your role. So, you know, clearly with your background, you're well positioned to give us a good overview of what's involved in exporting. Um, and, and I think, you know, in this webinar, we're particularly going to focus on the players involved in the export supply chain or the value chain. Um, I think if we if we look at the roles each supplier plays, it really helps to understand the whole process and the activities involved as each step. Um, because it's fair to say, isn't it, Gautam? It's quite complex. There's quite a lot of steps in that process. Um, so uh, yeah, tackling it from that way hopefully will will help to clarify just what uh, what you have to do right from processor, uh, producer, um, right through to customer. So um, we'll see how we go. But um, before we start um, on on that process, Gautam, can you tell us a little bit more about um, uh, perhaps about the current products that are exported from the Pacific and and where they're going? You know, what are the key exports and and, and where are they going to? Okay, I mean through our experience or with COVID coming in, I think we have seen a massive uh, growth in exports from the islands. I mean, of course, tourism used to be major focus for many Pacific islands, including uh, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa. And that used to be a day-to-day, -day, uh, what we call it, income for many, many people back home. But due to COVID coming in, uh, there's no tourism, no flights. So basically, people have moved to the second option, which is agriculture. Right? So. Pacific Islands, of course, have a lot of resources in terms of agriculture. And because of our tropical climate, uh, a lot of uh, agricultural products has been produced, but has never been, the market wasn't been developed. And with the last, I mean, since the last one and a half years, since the COVID has come in, we have seen a lot of people are taking opportunity to export agriculture. So in, in terms of agriculture, when we say is basically root crops, mm -hmm. It could be cassava, it could be yams, uh, dalo. Uh, other good crops is, uh, we call it uvi. So this, I mean, they have scientific names, but the islands, they use these names. Then we move into uh, coconuts, right? So different uh, skews of coconuts, could be coconut cream, uh, desiccated coconut, whole right. coconut, dry coconut, right? And then moving to the next level is perishable goods. So. Before in New Zealand, a lot of perishable goods used to come from Fiji because this used to be the export market in terms of vegetables like eggplant or basically ligaments or it could be beans. But now because Fiji is not able to meet the demand for, for many reasons, uh, it's because maybe it's because of a lockdown or because there's not enough resources available. So now we have seen 
the other Pacific Islands, such as Vanuatu, PNG, you know, uh, Tonga, Samoa, they're coming on board and they are able to uh, fulfill the balance which is needed into New Zealand market, into Australian market, USA market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest, I would say, is export out of this region is now Kava. Kava mm -hmm. is now used as medications, which goes up to Germany, UK, and other European markets, which no one has introduced before. So Pacific Island use Kava as a social drink, but the European market are using it as a medication. So now we can see uh, the level of, of how these products have advanced in the last couple of years and looks like it will keep growing. Mm. In, in the statistics for, for EIF, what EIF does in Oakland itself is we do about 10 containers of RIFA per week, which is like six to 800 bags of frozen crops coming into New Zealand market every week. Wow. And it keeps growing. It, we started with like two to three containers per week. Now we have gone to 10. And mm -hmm. coming into the peak season, because now we are moving into the festive season, which is Christmas, New Year, we can predict there will be more containers coming in. So it all de depends on the seasonal. Um, yeah. Ashland New Zealand is going into winter, or we are already in winter. So we believe there will be a more consumption in terms of food items, because a lot of people will be staying home, taking leaves, or basically winter brings uh, people start to eat a lot in terms of to keep their body warm. So we have seen a lot of growth, yeah. Mm. Oh, wow, that's that's really interesting. Um, I mean, so it's, it's good to hear as well that exports are, are growing. And actually, I was reading a, um, a Pharma Plus report the other day, and it's the Pacific Export Context Analysis. I think it was the November 2020 report. And that was really interesting too. And one of the key things that I, I saw in that report was that um, the Pharma Plus countries, which are actually the same countries that BLP work yeah. in pretty much, um, they, were, they were exporting more food exports, more food products, and they were importing. So there was a difference, um, positive positive trade balance of about, um, I think it was about 1.4 billion US dollars. That yeah. was quite a shock to me that, that there was uh, that going on. I mean, I know other imports, um, you know, particularly hardware, uh, yeah. sends the trade balance the other way. There's a trade deficit usually. But but with the food and um, exports, that was really quite amazing. And I, and I suppose the report did also, you know, say that um, that's largely driven by PNG's food exports, you know, principally um, palm oil, but also in Solomon's is the uh, seafood uh, um, and, and Kiribati as well. Um, and it did also say that, um, you know, from a per capita basis, Samoa, Kiribati and Tonga, they had significant food trade deficits, if you like. But nonetheless, I, th I thought that was quite fascinating that, um, you know, more, more food exports were, were going out of the Pacific Islands as a whole than, than importing. Um, and also it spoke about um, destinations like China, um, Australia, Japan and Taiwan and Korea starting to come up as well in terms of not so much in volume, which is perhaps what you're talking about, Gautam, but but more in, in terms of value. So, um, you know, it's really promising to see that, um, that that's, uh, that's building. Um, so, yeah, so interesting. And actually also mentioned um, about Carver. Um, so the report said that, you know, largely Pacific countries are, are pretty much price takers for commodities like copper and coffee and, and you know, palm oil, etc. But yeah. not so with the kava. You know, it's much more of a value added um, product and it can, can uh, get a, a higher price, basically, because they're for specialist markets. So exactly what you're saying. So, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I mean, yeah, that's really true. Like, I mean, like Japan, uh, Korea, they're coming up and now, because, for example, I would say it's like cassava. Cassava is high in starch. Right. right? And basically, they add value to it and they sell it back to us. So they import cassava as a raw material. They are able to uh, add value and put it as a starch and they back to us and they sell it to us. Similarly for sugar, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing, like Fiji used to be one of the biggest exporters of sugar into, into the Pacific Islands, I would say, and also to Australia market. Mm -hmm. Now it's opposite. We wow. have, we are not exporting sugar now. Uh, and I, I just read the other day that Fiji is shortage of sugar. So 
I mean, there are opportunities in terms of agriculture, and I would say COVID could probably give some lesson to the Pacific Islanders to probably focus on agriculture rather than uh, trying to focus on sectors which may not be able to generate enough income for people. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's certainly, it's certainly interesting and good to understand the bigger picture context, what's going on. But um, anyway, let, let's look at the key players and the suppliers in the exporting process. So now look, <laughs> we've used these little cartoon icons to depict the players in the supply chain. I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if it works well, but anyway, you'll see these icons used in the slides when Gautam starts explaining further what, what roles they play. So I guess it sort of starts with the producer, as, as you can see in this case, that's a, a farmer, it's the, that's the little coconut man with the, <laughs> with the fork there, but it, it could equally be a seafood or, or handicap crafts producer, I guess. And then this, this supply chain or this value chain goes right through to the customer who you can see in the, the bottom right hand um, corner there. So, um, so Gautam, can you just briefly run through who those little, little um, cartoon figures are supposed to represent? Okay, okay, uh, so I mean, the first, first cartoon is basically a producer. And yeah. so basically a farmer or could be a, a mid or no, not a middleman, basically a farmer who's uh, producing the product. It could yeah. be agriculture or could be a manufacturing. So basically that becomes a producer. That means that's the start of the uh, the supply chains. The first person, the important person of the supply chain is a producer. Yeah. Cool. Uh, then the second person in the, uh, in the cartoon is the quality control. So basically once the item is produced or is, big, uh, is basically uh, the farmer is ready with his production then goes to the quality control yeah quality control is means the patient or it could be a government agency or could to check that the quality is important or its quality is good for exports mm -hmm. before it's been, uh, been packaged right so if the quality is not good then it goes to the local market if the quality is good then it can be exported so i think that's how the supply chain works we say oh we have a second grade which is could be used for for the local market and yeah. first grade is always is an export market All right and the third carton becomes your packaging mm -hmm. uh, packaging is basically uh, getting ready uh to be exported uh, local markets they can also packaging can be used for local market but mostly uh we focus packaging for overseas or export market. Okay. The yeah, who's this? The next, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the next picture is the middleman. Yeah, right. Can, so a middleman can be an exporter, right? Or he can also be a shipper. In shipping terms, if uh, I know a couple of people are already shipping, so a shipper can be an exporter, or also can be we can call as a middleman. So the role of exporter is basically. He becomes the headman for shipping. He looks after, so he becomes the person is a shipper who will be organizing all the shipment. It could be a uh, a company, it could be a, a person or a agency, right? So that becomes a shipper. The next is uh, transport. So in terms, uh, with an example, I could give is let's say a exporter or shipper is a consolidator. That means he's has a warehouse in somewhere in his area where he brings products from different producers, different farmers, and then packs his, his one container. He checks everything at his premises, uh, gets ready and transports to uh, to the next level, which is customs and bioinspection, right? Mm -hmm. So that becomes, customs and bioinspection is now becoming a very important uh, player rolling into international export market. The reason why, because if customs and the local bio of authority does not fulfill the right documentation, no matter how or no matter how you, better you have done in the first a cartoon, which is a producer or as a packing or as a shipper, basically your shipment is of no use. Because mm -hmm. the agencies, the biosecurity of the importer country and the biosecurity of exporter country basically they work as an agency and they believe each other rather than believing an importer or exporter. So whatever documents is coming from the other agency should be matching with the agencies who's receiving the documentation. Right. Yeah. So that's where the MPI or we call it biosecurity or customs plays a major role. Mm -hmm. And once all those is fulfilled, 
uh, your cargo is ready to be shipped out. Right. So, so there's kind of that biosecurity on both sides. Hey, on the on the host country side, if you like, and then on the destination country as well. Yeah. I mean, yes. Uh, because uh, for for any goods, uh, basically, we're talking about root crops, right? For example, they have to make sure that there is phyto sets. Yes. There's other requirements uh, met by the uh, the importer country's government. Right. Because, like, for example, if I'm saying, let's say we import something mm. from uh, Russian agriculture wants, Russian agriculture doesn't want their agriculture to be destroyed by, uh, by something which is not allowed in the Russian market. So MPI in customs in the, in the exporter country has to fulfill the demand, make sure they do not allow any insects or any uh, fleas or whatever to come into our agriculture. Because mm -hmm. if that comes into our agriculture, that means we are disturbing our agriculture, which is one of the biggest market for New Zealand market. Yeah. So that's where these agencies have to play a major role. Right. Okay, okay and then we move to PEC. So you can see in the exporter country, the producer becomes the first person, but in the importer country, the customs and MPI becomes the first person. And now we can understand the importance of why uh, these agencies are important. Right? So it's now works the other way around. Once the shipment arrives into, let's say, an international market, then the customs and MPI will have a thorough check, which is such as they have to make sure the documentation are correct, the product is not illegal into the market, it has a top quality, uh, and when all these approved, with certain GST or duty to be paid to relevant authorities, and then the cargo is released. So the next cartoon is you can see is basically delivery. So once uh, customs and other formalities are fulfilled, comes to a freight forwarder's yard like EIF, right? And so I'll just briefly explain uh, the role of freight forwarders in New Zealand. In, in different countries, for example, I would say in Fiji, right? Uh, I would say that not all freight forwarders are TF approved. In New Zealand, it's different. In New Zealand, you cannot take in containers to your normal warehouses. You have to have an approved facility. When we say approved facility, we call it ATF. That's called approved transition facilities. Those facilities have a allocated area where you can keep containers. You, you need to have people who are approved to check containers. Uh, and it's it's one of the requirements by MPI, the uh, Ministry of Primary Industries, to just to make sure that the goods are correctly checked before it goes to the market. If everyone starts getting goods to their warehouse, there's no quality, there's no control on in terms of the channels. So that's the reason the MPI is very strict with who are these importers having these ATF facilities? Not everyone can have it. Some people can have it with a very strict conditions. So are so, you saying, Gautam, that um, some of that biosecurity uh, role that's normally at, at the border, sometimes that can get delegated, that, that sort of checking and inspection role can be delegated to a, uh, a freight forwarding company to do that? Yes, totally That's correct. Awesome. So they've got, yeah. to, they've got to be certified by MPI to do that certified, role. Yeah. So we call it AP in here. Uh, that means uh, approved patient. Yeah. And there's a certain uh, courses which we have to attend uh, before they certify you to be a, a proof patient. Yeah. And then you can only accept the containers. Yeah. 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 It's just centralizing and making things uh, not uh, complicated for everyone. Mm. And because, I mean, the region is quite, our district is quite big uh, and the MPI can't be at all the places at, within the day. So mm -hmm. it's better to have a certain facility where the MPI officer can go and have a look at five containers rather than going to five different sites, traveling to, to look at. So it's like saving time, uh, saving expenses. So it's all added mm -hmm. together. Yeah, I've got a friend who, uh, who's who got a, a plastics manufacturing business, actually, and he's got that certificate. He's approved by MPI to to do that checking, that inspection on, on behalf of, um, well, you know, it's not the on behalf of, he's delegated by MPI. Yeah. 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 yeah, and there's certain requirements, like they will come and audit uh, every couple of yeah. months. They'll come and audit to make sure that you are following the processes. And if you're not, if you fail the audit, then your license could be cancelled. Right. Which will add to additional cost for reapplying and all that. Eh? Yeah. 
So different countries has different regulations, but that's for New Zealand is an importing country. Uh, then moving to the next cartoon, uh, we can see a person with wheelbarrow. That means it's already to be taken to the retail or distribution center. Mm -hmm. And the next is shop, which is all good to be retail. And then happy customer. Finally, the customer. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's quite a long-winded process, really, isn't it? Lots of players involved. And of course, um, it doesn't always have to be that they're different um, firms or different organisations. So, you know, often one one um, producer might pack their own goods. So they might do quality control. They might do, you know, the first first four of those icons. They might, yeah. Um, yeah, they might do one of those processes. But I think it's fair to say that, you know, every time you look at those roles, there's going to be cost added to the process. And so when you're exporting, you have to factor that in. You have to think about those costs the value points that each player um, adds, um, you've got to pay for it. So, um, you know, that, that's just normal. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> okay, so perhaps then let's focus a little bit more in on that first part, perhaps uh, in the activities prior to shipping first. So, so if a producer is thinking about exporting, so thinking from the, the producer's point of view, um, or product manufacturer, what, what are some of the key considerations that they need to think about? Okay, uh, as a producer, first of all, is to decide what item basically he or she wants to produce, right? It, and all it depends from the market demand, right? So we uh, are, it's not useful if you are producing the same item which is already in a market. Right? So it's all depend on the planning. So uh, basically, the producer has to have a market before he or she can commit for producing. Right? Mm -hmm. And the reason why this black person or the black uh, dressed person comes in the market is because the producer hasn't done his homework, maybe, and he couldn't get a uh, what call it a distribution uh, distribution market, the aftermarket, and that's where this middleman comes in and say, "Hey, okay, I'll take your goods." and I'll make some money out of it. Mm. Right? Yeah, I think that's a really good point that you make. It's often really difficult for a producer, like particularly if you're thinking about a grower, you know, a farmer that's growing produce. They may not be familiar with markets in New Zealand or Australia or, or somewhere else overseas. Right. Um, and so they've got no idea what those customers are expecting, whereas somebody like the exporter, they might have those networks already, and so they know exactly, they know what quality is involved, they know where the channels are going to be, and yeah. so they can take that produce from... Um, from the farmer, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, most important, I mean, apart from production is, other important thing is pricing and costing, mm. uh, which is, I mean, if you are getting a new product into the market and if you have a similar product in the market and if your price is higher than the quality product, which is already in the market, basically it, it doesn't serve the purpose of why you are producing the same product. Right? For example, I would say is, let's say you're having a, a apple which is a dollar and then you're having another apple which is one dollar fifty so people if are used to the same quality of apple which is one dollar why should you go for one dollar fifty or no so it all depends if you do your costing before you can start your production mm. and the more the people are involved or the parties are involved that means your cost will be increasing yeah. every party will add a value to it uh, it could be a positive value or could be a negative value, but it's it's in terms, it's a cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. And that's where, you know, sometimes a producer may uh, um, may do a lot more uh, of the value adding themselves rather than employ different people. But those, those activities still need to happen one way or another. And I used to run a, a biosecurity facility in Tonga. Um, and that treated fresh produce such as um, chilies, eggplants, papaya um, for fruit fly. Um, so when I looked through the supply chain, um, it, it, it soon became quite obvious actually that some of the Tongan produce and producers, they couldn't really sell eggplant, for example, into the New Zealand market because the price point was just too low. So, um, you, know, you know, there's two ways of looking at, at things. You, you've got to think about your market at the end, your end user or your consumer and how much they're prepared to spend. Now, the market for eggplant in New Zealand was pretty low because there's Fiji that was uh, exporting eggplants. There's also producers in New Zealand that was producing it. And so Tonga couldn't comp compete. Yeah. Um, and cover all of those costs. 
um, for eggplant. But for chilies, on the other hand, and papaya, um, that was a much more viable um, proposition um, because they commanded a higher price in New Zealand. So that whole um, value proposition, that viability testing that you're talking about, that's really, really important. Uh, so just because you can grow it really well and you can grow heaps of it doesn't mean that you're going to be, make it profitable. And eggplant was a really good example of that in Tonga. Yeah. I mean, other thing, I mean, a lot of uh, exporters or producers probably won't know, Pacific Islands have the most approved commodity with our MPI. So um, approved commodities means all, all the all the agriculture product. So it's already been approved, but a lot of farmers haven't tried that right. having approvals from our own NPIs to allow uh, produce coming into the national market is good but no one has like like chilies right it's, it's a big demand in the national market mm. but mm. probably a lot of countries are not doing it there's other commodities like ginger ginger is very common right? uh, we have uh, uh, ginger papaya watermelon see watermelon is a big demand in the national market Mm. And so there are other more commodities which agriculture products we have in our regions which we haven't tried uh, because probably no one knows about it maybe yeah. or the, the ministries haven't discussed that all oh, these are the approved commodities. So I think at the moment the most approved commodity is coming from Fiji mm -hmm. uh, but the similar commodities can also be produced in other maybe Tonga and Samoa at a lower cost. In terms, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, what do you call it, like Fiji has cyclones uh, from every uh, ev every year we have cyclone. While Tonga Samoa are very, they have cyclones, but not to that extent. So that's why they're able to produce more popo over Fiji. So this, those are some of the strengths which could be used mm. over a different uh, different region in the, in the same same Pacific region no so maybe Tonga can focus on purple while Fiji can focus on something else it could be a shared commodity right and because I often think of the Pacific Islands as being like New Zealand's um, winter garden <laughs> you know like when when things are off off peak in New Zealand the Pacific you can turn to the Pacific so there's, there's some real opportunities at this time of year uh, I think for the New Zealand market but that, that's just one market okay um so after production then um what are some of the packing considerations okay uh now we're moving to i mean packaging uh into international market is a very key component uh number one is if your packaging is not correct that means even though you have shipped it your cargo could be rejected into the uh, into the market uh so it has to be visible that's the first thing uh fit for purpose that means uh it should be able if it's general cargo it should be able to fit in the shelf have a shelf life uh have to be protected airtight waterproofed uh and most important is cost effective right so a uh, simple example i would give is there's a certain limitations on how many packages should be in a carton if it exceeds that means the quality is not getting better or it's going to be too heavy for a consumer to lift. Right. So this is these are some of the and I mean if you make it more heavier, that means it will be more cost. Cause in terms of transportation, if it's heavier, you'll be charged more in terms of cost. Mm -hmm. So the package has to be, I mean, international standard. That's what we can say ISO standard in order to make sure that the customer is happy, and also to make sure it is available for all age group from a probably a young person of 10 years old to a uh, aged person probably a 70 year old that means that person can have access to okay yeah. so, so what you're saying then is not only does your packaging need to be fit for purpose for the consumer the end consumer but you've also got to think about packaging during transportation um, and and so you know that's a really great example about it. you know you can't have your um, you can't have a box of um, jars of coconut oil, for example, that's too heavy because otherwise somebody can't lift that uh, yep. through customs. So, you know, really important considerations about how you package things up. So, you know, going back to your point that you made before about planning, the planning is so important throughout the whole phase of this, isn't it? Like packaging, yes. you've got to think about all of that stuff up front. Uh, no, no, totally correct, yeah. I mean, 
planning has to be the planning is a major component here if you plan it well then your product will last in the market right mm -hmm. and Pacific Island market is is used to of not following the packaging requirement mm. right? I mean right. other things is you know there's legislation that gets introduced in different countries you've got to be familiar with legislation around labeling so you know I know in New Zealand um, some of the labeling um, considerations you've got to make sure that you you list down every every item that's in there every ingredient yeah. that's in there. it's it's really quite complicated so you've got to be familiar with those things have to have nutritional effects yeah. uh expiry date uh right. manufacturing dates for example uh barcode so that it's uh so now people can scan and get all the information so this is are uh, some of smaller things but very important for international markets Mm. And now people are moving into, uh, for example, a barcode which once you scan it in your phone, you can get all the details about the manufacturer, the supplier, uh, when it was shipped, when it was received, and all the ingredients online rather than reading into a bottle. So this is all into modern day, uh, modern day packaging now. Uh, we are moving towards modern day packaging. And I think it's, it's fair to say that, you know, often for horticultural products in particular, you, you know, it's not unusual for the packaging to actually be more expensive than the produce itself. And, you know, it seems it seems a bit ridiculous to be paying more for the item that you put it in um, than the item itself. But that, that, that is often the case. Uh. I would agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next thing then, um, biosecurity. So you, you've touched on this before, but um, can you can you tell us a little bit about the biosecurity requirements? And I know that some countries have different requirements um, and different restrictions. So why is that? Uh, okay, um, I mean biosecurity becomes uh, so basically they are the frontliners. Right? Right. They are they are the ones who are going to say yes and no. Uh, we talk we talk about any goods coming into the market or into the country uh, mostly on agriculture uh the reason why uh, biosecurity has standards uh which i have touched before is because putting an example is new zealand our biggest probably export is agriculture right and we we don't want to have a conflict with other agricultural products coming and spoiling our agriculture and that's why if you even if you are traveling you're going to see that the biosecurity officers at the border are very strict you can't have any soils in your shoes you can't have any grains in your shoes no flowers no leaves the reason is why because it may interact with our agriculture and that won't basically that means if it interacts with our agriculture we're losing job we're losing income while we allowing other Pacific islands to trade with us we also have to make sure that our economy is stable, which is to keep our agriculture going. And that's why it has kept, uh, we have import health uh, requirements and standards, is to make sure that a person, whoever consumes this, is in good health. If we allow bad things or uh, what do you call it, uh, rotten stuffs coming into the neutral market, that means we are making our people sick. Mm. So first point of entry or exit or yes and no is our biosecurity people. We say, okay, this is not good quality. It's better to return it back. And sometimes people are basically exporting thing that all oh, returning back means no to their products. It's not actually saying no, it's meaning that please, can you look into your products? Yeah. Which means, can you improve it? There's a room for improvement. Like I said before, we have been given approved commodity to most of the products. And it has never been disapproved. The only thing we need is to make sure that all the exporters follow the right process. And the right process starts from, from the producers, the first player to the local exporting agencies, which is our customs and uh, bio offices down in, in any country. And then our bio offices will just follow up to make sure that they have followed the right process. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. And then the next is uh, our treatment protocols. Mm -hmm. That is basically to make sure that like this couple of uh, treatment, one is fumigation. So I'll touch base on perishable and also on frozen. Perishable, uh, we have two options, which is I think uh, fumigation, uh, like watermelon, uh, dalo. Mm -hmm. uh, this can be fumigated at certain uh, percentage 
Uh, and then we have heat treatment. I think coconuts and uh, these other coffee beans, cocoa, they are, can be heat treated. And for frozen, that does not require any treatment. If there's a frozen produce coming into the market, we do not require treatment because it is usually below 18 degrees, uh, means it's already safe. Uh, no insects, flies, or can last in the minus 18 degrees. So yeah. that's where the frozen becomes a safer way of sending your product. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point. So you know, sometimes you can um, you can get around the biosecurity uh, by um, thinking a little bit more and planning a little bit more about how you send your produce. So if you sell if you send it in a frozen state, um, so you add a little bit more value in the um, exporting countryside before it crosses the border. If you add some more value by you know um, washing it, cleaning it. Um, cutting it, getting it ready for um, being frozen and then freezing it and then sending it over, you, you don't have the same biosecurity requirements as if it was fresh and perishable, like you say. So um, I know New, New Zealand is very, very strict because of, as you say, our industries, our primary industries, and fruit flow is a particular concern. So those import health standards, they're actually legal documents, hey, they're legal um, standards that must be met um, for certain crops. So if you're wanting to... Um, export to New Zealand then you can go on the MPI website and have a look at um, have a look at the, the crop or the produce that you're wanting to export if it's perishable then that import health standard will tell you the treatment protocol that it's got to go through so um, I know when I was running the um, the biosecurity facility it, it was a, a an HTFA facility, so which is a, a high temperature forced air treatment yep. um, so that heated produce to about 45 degrees and and the whole um protocol was around killing fruit fly and its larvae um fumigation is another protocol for uh, other types of um crops so so they use that for watermelon um because if you put watermelon through the heat treatment you yeah, watermelon juice um it's just too too hot so um different protocols for different different crops and then there's some crops that you might find have no protocol at all and then if you've got to go through the process of requesting an import health standard for that crop then that's really quite quite long-winded so yeah. consideration around what you can do to add value to your produce before you export it can actually really help you through that biosecurity um, process. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I will also touch base on one more. Like, I mm. mean, even though we can fulfill all the protocols, right? For, for example, we send in a container of Dalo from Pacific Islands. You may have fumigated your container. It's already to be to be shipped to New Zealand market, of course. But if your container is dirty, dirty means of course, your container would be sitting on a grass probably near your warehouse. And if that container has a soil, your whole container can be rejected. Mm. Or otherwise, it would be taken to a wash bay uh, for washing and then full fumigation again. So it's very important to make sure your outer packing and inner packing is all being clean. And that's a requirement for biosecurity to make sure that we do not miss small things. Because those container um, where this forklift fits the um, to lift up container usually have soils around or even truck when they are coming from a farm, uh, basically going out for to the pot, they may have mud in their tires or dust, which can also carry uh, flies or insects around. Yeah, that, that's so this, really good advice. Things that pe people don't really think about, hey, but it has to be absolutely clean. You're right. We, we had a case here where uh, the container came from a Pacific Island country and it it was all good approved, but it has uh, soil and grasses towards the end. And it basically leads to probably around $5,000 cost because you have to get inspected. They have to test if that grass has no insects. Mm. And then if it's fails the inspection then has to go for full fumigation and oh, adds destination and adds additional force, yeah. delays of that adds additional basically is going from your profit margin yeah, yeah. so small things are basically you not know, could be keyword just to make sure we are doing the right thing in the, the time of export yeah 
No, very good advice. So, okay, so then we get to the shipping and logistics. Now, this is this is really quite a, a test of your logistics skills, really, isn't it, and coordination. <laughs> so typically, who and, and how is the shipping and the logistics organised? Who, who's involved in that? Uh, okay, uh, going back to the... So if, if the uh, producer or the farmer is organising uh, by organizing by himself so he can become the supplier or the shipper and can go to a local freight forwarding agency yeah. to book a container or air freight or shipment and they can look after all the custom screens and that's where the freight forwarder plays a major role so we become like a middleman that means yeah. we are an agency for uh, biosecurity freight forwarding uh, for a shipping company and also for a customs so we try to help like a middleman to help the shipper or the producer to fulfill all the requirements. Mm -hmm. So in a role of EI, what we do is, if I put as an example is, so if anyone is planning to export any goods from New Zealand to Australia market, what we do is we help the supplier or producer understand to provide proper information so that his information can uh, meet the requirement from New Zealand uh, for Australia market. So that becomes the role of a, a freight forwarder like EIF. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, timing and coordination is the important thing. The reason why, because let's say, if you have a produce, you pack your produce ready to be to be shipped out, but there's no vessel. Mm. It means your shipment is still sitting in the island or anywhere yeah. and there's no vessel. So who can help is basically shipping logistics people. They will plan your shipment, okay? This is the day the vessel coming in. This is the day your container has to be at the wharf. Documents cleared, customs cleared, MPI cleared, your documents done, ready to be shipped. Mm. So you know, you've got to time it right. You know, those those the papaya, they've got to be ripe and ready to be picked and packed at exactly the same time as that plane's gonna leave or that ship's gonna leave. It's quite it's quite complicated, isn't it? <laughs> no, 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 you have to be have, have your timing right, otherwise all the banana will be ripe. Yeah. Yeah. Container. yeah. Oh gosh. And then um I suppose the next thing, and this is a really big area now, is the documentation. So I know, uh, um, Gautam, when, when we were having a chat about this, you, you, uh, oh, it just seemed like it was such a tricky part of the, of the whole process that you've absolutely got to pay a huge amount of attention to. So can you just run through uh, the documentation or some of the documentation that's required? Because there's quite a lot um, as it leaves the port of, of the exporting country. Okay, uh, here's an importing country, or basically also is an exporting country. Uh, documentation is an important part. Uh, like I said, agencies believe on the documentation. If you have a proper documentation, that means you can have a smooth flow of your operation. And the most important documents to start with is bill of lading. So uh, bill of lading, uh, most of people know is a shipping document, which basically describes where the shipment coming from, who is the shipper and who is the receiver and it's controls, it becomes like a negotiation, a negotiable uh, document to allow to clear your shipments in, in any country. Uh, and bill of lading will have all the information like your container number, uh, where it's coming from, which vessel is coming from, who will be the party to be connect, uh, contacted on arrival with the person shipping. Then the next important document is invoice. Uh, we call it commercial invoice CI. So this becomes your uh, trade uh, documents, which means commission invoice will be used for customs and MPI clearance. The value which is mentioned, so invoice will have certain details such as the description of the commodity. It could be, let's say, banana, total kg, right? how it's packed, how many packages, how many semi-packages, the total value for the whole container, unit price. And based on the invoice, that invoice is used for customs and MPI clearance. If there's no invoice, that means we cannot move to the second stage. Mm. Right? Then the packing list. So packing list is a supporting documents. There's certain things which cannot be listed on the invoice, has to be on the pack, or on a, on a packing list to describe the detailed packaging. So that's why we call it packing list. So invoice is like a summary and packing list becomes the detailed uh, of, the, of the product. 
The next one is biosecurity documents. We call it BACC, right? So once we receive bill of lading, invoice, and packing list, what we do is we lodge with a uh, with MPI and customs. Once they process it, they will issue you with uh, BACC. A BACC is approval. That means your cargo is in good condition. Uh, your invoice is correct. Your bill of lading is correct and can be transferred to our ATF facility. We call it ATF. So once those three things are in order, we get the fourth one, which is, which is BACC. So the next document is FIDO Senator Certificate. Uh, FIDO Sets uh, is a document usually issued by the exporting country's uh, biosecurity office. It will have the legal name of the product being exported uh, and detail of like, is it being fumigated? What is the fumigation criteria? The component of fumigation, let's say either it's heat treated, fumigated, or other methods of uh, treatment. So final, with the FATO sanitary certificate, a MPI officer who is doing the recon will be able to decide that the requirements have been fulfilled from the exporting country. And without FATO sanitary, there's no moving to the next stage. Also uh, to note that uh, for all the perishable goods, we will need original FIDO sets. For uh, frozen, it's okay. Uh, you can just uh, send over the scan copy. Like I said before, uh, frozen is not as risky as a perishable cargo. Mm -hmm. The next uh, document is quarantine declaration. Majority of the countries, they do not use quarantine deck. I know Fiji doesn't use it. I know Tonga and Samoa doesn't use it. Quarantine declaration is, or we can also call container declaration, which I have spoken, uh, I think on the other topic, to make sure the person who's shipping is confirming the container, outside container area is also clean. And we call it as quarantine or container declaration. And that has to be supplied. If that is not supplied, that means your container cannot be taken out of the wharf. It's a separate document. And so, yep. And then the basic INCO terms, right? Uh, there's three major terms which is being used currently for international trade. Uh, first is FOB. We call it free on board. Free on board basically means the shipper's responsibility is to deliver the container to the wharf and the buyer has to take over the risk from port to port and manage all the clearance and delivery. The second term is CFR. We call it cost and freight. The supplier or the shipper's responsibility is to basically pay the freight and also the cost of the goods. So it becomes CFR, cost and freight, or the local charges plus the freight. And then the next term is, which is CIF. So many, many uh, buyers and suppliers want CIF, which also includes insurance. So there's no difference. The only thing is there's a new addition term, which is insurance. So that means the buyer has to provide the cost, pay the cost of the goods, pay the freight, and also insure the cargo if there's any damages or if anything happens within uh, the transportation and uh, the shipper's responsibility is to make sure he covers the loss. Mm. Yeah. I'm starting to see when you when you run through all of that documentation, I'm starting to see like just how important it is to get uh, an exporter, a freight forwarder, or some sort of agent to help you um, with that exporting process. It really is quite challenging. And look, we've, we've only got to um, the, the suppliers who were in the host uh, com country or the, the exporting country. So, so now let's look at those suppliers on the other side. Um, so firstly, at, at the border then. Um, so what happens at the border? When okay. they move in the, in the border, border? So the important part is, okay, if you are importing, let's say you're planning to import into the New Zealand market, the first key component is you need to have a customs client code. Right. right. So that comes under customs. Customs client code is like a it's like a payment or a number, right? That means the customs will register you in the system and you become an importer. So you have to fill a certain forms and get a customs client code so that customs can have a record of your if your importation. Once you get the customs. Sorry, the, yeah. the main role of customs, because I think it gets a little bit confused between customs and biosecurity, but their main role is to collect taxes, right? 
GST and tax, yes. GST and, and tax, okay, yeah, yeah. sorry. So, uh, because Pacific Island market is already part of uh, certain trade agreements with New Zealand, right? So there is no duty on any product coming out of uh, of the Pacific Island into New Zealand market and similar to Australia market. So there's no duty, there's only 15% GST. But in order for customs to process your GST, you need to have your, it's like a TIN number. In Fiji, you call it a TIN number. In, in the Pacific Island, we call it as a TIN number, but here we call it as a customs client code. It's a special code given to you and you will have to use it every time you import. Right. So at Guara, so we do the customs clearance, customs decides, okay, uh, you everything is correct. You pay the GST. And then uh, once the GST is paid, then it's passed down to MPI. Right. So mm -hmm. MPI's role is to do reconciliation. Mm -hmm. That means, and they work on behalf of customs also to make sure that right. whatever the goods is coming is, is actually just with the invoice or the packing list. Mm -hmm. right? uh, we have, there's always a case where the goods is in excess or good is in shortage. It's also to help the buyer to sustain any loss. Let's say if uh, if MPI comes and audits and finds thousand carton is missing, because MPI becomes a uh, legal authority of New Zealand, they can always support the buyer and say, hey, when we open your container, there was a thousand carton shortage, and that can be used as a tool to get refund from the from the exporter. So the reason why we have reconciliation done in New Zealand market is first of all to make sure the goods are in correct order, packaged well. And whatever commodity or quantity is mentioned on invoice is coming in. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, forgery. There's no uh, what do you call it? Uh, surplus goods coming in. Mm -hmm. No prohibited or restricted yeah. goods coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, high tax goods such as tobacco. Right? Mm -hmm. New Zealand does not allow tobacco smuggling, weapons smuggling. Uh, smuggling. So this has been in in uh, in, few, in uh, previous. Times it has been used as smuggling, uh, smugglings because frozen containers you can easily smuggle anything. Mm -hmm. It's frozen and you can put. So now there's a hundred percent recon. Everything of the container has to come out, and the MPI officer will count each and every bag mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, everything is in correct order. Right. So not only does uh, does that authority, whether it's MPI in New Zealand or another similar. Um, biosecurity uh, uh, um, authority do the biosecurity check. They also look and confirm that what you've said you're exporting is what you're actually exporting. Um, so, so that's that recon or reconciliation process that you're talking about. Yeah. And I guess that's where all of those documents, you know, that's why you need all of those documents because they're checking all of that. Um, so you're really quite a thorough process that they go through as well, isn't it? And, and I mean, as you know, Pacific Island market is too much in giving away. Sometimes mm -hmm. they send cargoes which is undeclared for families yeah. and friends. They say, okay, uh, there's a space in the container, let's put some something which is not needed. No? <laughs> so right. I mean, we used to gifting people. So, yeah, okay, let's gift yeah. another 10 bags of this. Yeah, not just shove it in the container yeah. and we've got the space. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> they don't realize it's probably it's not allowed to. Let's say, uh, okay, we have excess tobacco leaf. Let's give it for someone for winter. Mm. But they don't understand tobacco leave is not allowed in this market. It's allowed, yeah. but the duty rate is very high. We're looking at like $10,000 for probably one ton. So mm. it's a big amount. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Wow. Um, so so now let's talk a little bit more about freight forwarders then. So what... So I think we're starting to get the, the gist of what, what value a freight forwarding company can do. Um, but do you have to use a freight forwarding company? I mean, are, are you obliged well, to? Or, or I mean, you do yes, like I said before, so we act like an agency for customs and MPI. Mm -hmm. So uh, we help. Without us, you cannot move further to the next step. Right? Mm -hmm. And an importer and an exporter cannot become be a customs clearance agency. Otherwise, there will be no... Uh, transparency. You, if you are an important exporter yourself and you're doing custom skins, basically you will be playing around with documentations. You can play around with GST. You can play around with taxes. You can uh, under-declare cargo. Right? So that's where I freight forwarder comes in to make sure that everything is properly channeled. Right? Right. So yeah. without freight forwarder, we, we like our brokers. We help yeah. you 
we help you sort out your shipping issues. Mm. We help you sort out your documentation. If any problem, yes, we have special people who can look after documentation. People who can help you with your insurance, mm. can help you with your uh, packing, help you with your international uh, import standards. Because if I import a start to focus on shipping, then or I export a or producer start to focus on shipping, that means his quality is going down. He will be wasting a lot of time doing small things which he's not even making a money out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's where freight forwarders like us can help. Say, hey, this is a rule and we can be a broker for you. We get everything sorted for you while you can just focus on your production. And I guess because you've got you're working from many different exporters, you, you know you've got that that coordination um, already under your belt, so it, it makes it much more economic. You know, it's an economies of scale basically to you, the freight forward company. Can you explain what what does three PL stand for? Okay, three uh, PL uh, in simple term we call it uh, modern day warehousing. Mm -hmm. So is that uh, like third party logistics? Is it? So it's third party logistics, uh, mm -hmm. but. The term we can also use is modern day warehousing. Okay. Uh, I'll start with the example. So TPL, it's like, okay, for example, you have a small business. Mm -hmm. And that small business, you just need to keep probably 10 pallets in your warehouse. Mm -hmm. And you're paying a $6,000 rent pay, pay month, for example. Either you keep one pallet or you're keeping a 10 pallet. Still, you have to pay the rent. You need to have a forklift, few staff to do your uh, you work around the warehouse. With modern day warehousing, what you can do is you can have a business, you can operate from home and you can keep your products into a into a warehouse like ours mm -hmm. and just don't have to worry about any operational cost. You don't have to pay a rent. You only have to pay pallet price. That's it. So if you have 10 pallets, you only pay for 10. If you have five pallets, you have to pay for five. Right? So we, modern day warehousing keeps your stocks. We audit your stock. And we also help you deliver your stock to your customers. Mm -hmm. While you can focus doing your sales and business development, we will handle your other work. We we'll bring it into a warehouse, we'll keep it. When and when required, we can repack it and deliver to your customers. So that's that's what a modern day warehousing. And a lot of businesses. So in, in New Zealand, I think I would say 60% of businesses is SMEs. Right? And everyone cannot afford. Why you want to have a warehouse yeah. and pay operational cost when you can just pay for a pallet and yeah. you know, and just focus on, on uh, retailing or just doing your business development? Sounds like a good deal to me. Go to, um, I think I'd be in with that one. Oh, okay. we, we, we have 22,000 pallet position and it's all full. The reason why, because there's smaller businesses who it's an advantage for them. They don't have to pay any insurance. We look after their insurance. It's sitting in our facility. And our voice does all the work. Mm, okay. So the next thing then, from so from that warehouse, uh, exporters then need to think carefully about the channels and the distribution, uh, the distributors that they're going to use to get their products to the right market. So I suppose usually the customer takes care of all of that. They've got their own distribution channel. But, but what happens if an exporter has more than one customer that they're exporting to? Um, mm -hmm. What will they do if they don't have uh, uh, that that distribution um, network? Um, yeah, what are some of the considerations around distribution? Because you don't get involved in that as a freight forwarding company, do you? No. Uh, so distribution is not part of our uh, scope. Uh, the reason why because we it's also a conflict of interest. First thing because we keep products for many suppliers and many exporters, so we cannot get involved in distribution. While we do help customers in terms of we can store and distribute on their behalf, but do not entirely getting involved in distribution. Yeah. And it becomes the exporters or the importers' role to look for their own distribution channels or retail channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So typically, as I say, it's usually the retailer that takes care of that. But um, if you are uh, perhaps exporting to more niche 
um, customers and you've got several of them, then you are you do need to think carefully about who your distributor might be and how you're going to get to those those customers and how you're going to grow that. So, um, I mean, I know there's uh, there's organisations like Turners and Growers who might be your customer. You know, if you're selling your agricultural produce, and you might just think, oh, I'll just sell it to Turners and Growers. They can then go and distribute it around to the different supermarkets and market holders and and whoever. Um, but if you want to get to those niche um, stores or uh, those specialty shops, you might need to think a little bit differently than that. Um, what, what's your advice around that? Uh, I'll, I'll totally agree with you. I mean, this market is uh, something to consider uh, with, with current restrictions of traveling. Uh, I'll say an experience is usually people, uh, I know a lot of exporters, what they, they used to do was they used to ship their export and fly to New Zealand market, come to New Zealand and sell their produce and go back home with hefty cash. But with all these restrictions happening, uh, they have to be very careful. They have to have a, someone trustworthy decide to make sure they can sell their produce and pay them back. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, those market, uh, there used to be informal market. They used to sell around the market and get good money out of it. Uh, but probably they have to now focus with commercial partners. Otherwise, it probably won't be useful. Mm. Yeah. So going back to your point about, you know, planning is really important, you know, before you even send your, your produce uh, or product uh, across to another country, you've got to think about that market. And if you if you are wanting to go to some of those specialty places, um, you might need to support them with some advertising and promotions or, or you might even want to sell it online. You might be a, um, an exporter that sells that's got a, an online um, selling platform and then you need to be able to deliver those goods from somewhere and distribute them out from somewhere in your um, destination country. So all of that planning needs to take place. You've got to think about that. And, and think I, about that I think yeah, I agree with you. I mean, a lot of people have now moved to e-commerce. Right. So they, like I said before, so 3PL is where it can help. So you can sit at home and receive orders through your e-commerce platform while we can uh, get all the deliveries done. Right, right. right. So it, it becomes sensible while you can focus on uh, getting your orders ready to send us order and we can get it done. So e-commerce is becoming, but it will be only for uh, general goods. It can't be used for uh, frozen or principal goods because that's probably at a different scale. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're focusing on root crops or frozen produce, then you need to have a very good distribution channel. Mm -hmm. uh, it also leads to the, the quality. Like you cannot keep con frozen container unplugged for a day. Your produce will start to go bad. Mm -hmm. Same thing to the perishable. You can't leave your perishable item sitting at the airport for a couple of hours. It needs to be chilled straight away. Mm -hmm. So it has to be proper planned. If you are not having a very good aftermarket here, probably your produce will be sitting at the wharf at the airport getting rotten. Mm -hmm. So it all comes from planning what you want to achieve, uh, who your buyers are, uh, is there's any market, how's your cons cons uh, customer reaction, your pricing, mm -hmm. no packaging. Yeah. So it's all, all depends on your planning. Mm. I think just the other thing to add is, you know, sometimes that distributor can also play the role of a, a bulk breaker. So, so for example, you might sell, let's say, coconut oil. That's a good example of that, where you may sell it in bulk in one of those big, um, huge, um, I don't know, cubic meter of, 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 of a bladder it goes in, doesn't it? And then a distributor might break that down into the little jars. Uh, you know, one litre containers of uh, um, of coconut oil for the, the consumer market. So, you know, that could also be a role that uh, a distributor uh, plays for you. Um, yes. So so then finally, wow, finally it gets to the customer. Um, so what about the customers themselves? You know, what do they perceive as being value for money? What, what, what are their sorts of expectations? Because, again, we've got to think about all of this when you're exporting. It might be different to your customers in your own um, country, in your own market. Yeah, I think price and quality is the major thing. Uh, mm -hmm. People uh, value will only buy if the price and the quality is good. Mm -hmm. I mean, just it's, it's a normal person. If we go to any supermarket, first thing we look is price mm -hmm. and the, I mean, and price and quality, the two P's. Mm -hmm. And if those two matches and it's part of our budget, then we can buy it. Otherwise, we'll move to the next product. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
But increasingly, I think, um, you know, customers are also wanting to know, you know, where the products come from. You know, as we mentioned before, with the packaging, you've, you've got to think about the labeling. You've got to make sure you've identified where its origin is. You've got to uh, think about the contents, um, uh, make sure that it met some quality uh, quality standard, perhaps, whether that's organic certification or GMP or, or HACCP certifications. Um, and often these days, customers, they really want to know a little bit about um, you know, about this product and what, where it comes from, who's made it, what can the we origin, do? Yeah. We call it country of origin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so just having that understanding of the, of the customer is, um, is really important okay. too. So, wow, that's lots of players involved. That's lots of parts of the process. Uh, so thank you so much for going through that. That's, um, you know, really quite a, an involved value chain, really. Um, now, um, BLP has, is, is about to launch um, a new tool, which is uh, our export readiness tool. And some of the things that uh, we'll be looking at uh, in that tool is um, supporting a business to, to assess whether they have the systems and processes and thinking in place about whether, uh, whether they're capable of exporting or not. And so you know, here's a list of some of the things that you probably need to think through and that the tool will address. So certainly watch out for that new tool um, when it comes up. But um, Gautam, in, in your experience, what, what are the typical issues that exporters need to get right? What, what are some of the issues that, uh, that you've been aware of? I mean, through my experience, I would say is the, the major problem we face with most of the island exporters is documentation. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, I mean, documentation is the only legal documents which could be uh, we rely on. If your documentation is incorrect, that means there's nothing, there's no way forward. Your, your product could be the most A quality product in the world. Mm -hmm. But if your document doesn't match us with what our requirement is, that means that quality or that packaging is probably used, not, not, not used in the market. Right. So we, we have experience, uh, we experience every day. With so many, uh, so many hiccups, still a lot of exporters and importers uh, do the same mistake: not having proper documentation or documentation not coming on time, which delays uh, freight forwarders like us to do the custom clearance, which basically adds extra cost. Mm -hmm. Considering what is happening in the shipping hall at the moment, is that there's a lot of delays, there's a lot of port congestions, there's no supply of containers. No, uh, stocks are running out because the vessels are not coming on time or vessels are on quarantine. If we do our part correctly, which is documentation is in our control. That means we can decide, we can make it happen or not. Mm -hmm. So if we, pro uh, if we do the proper, uh, provide a proper documentation on time, that means you have passed the first step and the freight forwarder can basically get to uh, cargo cleared ASAP. So I think documentations and planning, I would say, right. is the best, uh, the most important tool at the moment. Okay. No, thank you yeah. for sharing sharing that. So um, I know that we're, we're running a little over time, um, but anybody uh, got any questions or comments? I see a few, uh, a few comments were being put in the comments box. Let me just see if I can have a look at those. Um, but any other questions uh, that people want to pop in the chat box now? Um, so let's have a look. Um, um, uh, Shimron, you'd like to know if there are any checklists that will be forwarded to the producer um, to go through and to meet each point to avoid disappointment. Yes, actually, uh, you guys have already covered it, that you will be providing with the checklist and all the things that we have to meet. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. That's good. Thank you. Is there any other questions, anyone? And now we will, of course, there will be the recording, um, Marianne, we'll, we will have the recording so you'll be able to access uh, that afterwards uh, once it's um, once we've finished uh, the webinar that will be up on the portal. Okie dokie. Yep. Um, now, where was that? I missed that, sorry. Somebody got another question? Okie dokie. 
All right. Well, um, look, if there's if there's no more questions, Gautam, perhaps I, I can ask you to maybe summarise or highlight some of the key points. And you've raised a lot of points in today's um, session, but perhaps you could just um, highlight, you know, what, what's really important, the most important things when thinking about exporting. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, with, with today's uh, webinar, I would, I would assume that a lot of uh, people involved now will be trying to export. Uh, I mean, agriculture is uh, one of the biggest uh, exporter commodity from the Pacific Islands, there's no doubt. And in order to, to grow that market, uh, the first thing is planning, which we have discussed and we have been briefing uh, every time. So please do plan your, plan your uh, uh, products from the beginning. With planning comes your costing, right, to make sure please add uh, proper costing if you need help, please go to a freight forwarding company like us, or you can come to BLP and we will help you out with checklist, uh, the requirements from different MPI groups, right? Please don't overthink that you know, you are meeting all the requirements. Different countries have different requirements. requirements. It's, it's better to ask, right? And, and there's freight forwarders like us. It's not, I'm not meaning that only EIF can help. Could be any freight forwarder. Your local freight forward agency can help you out, understand the requirements. Because I'll give you a simple example, or I'll just say a simple summary, which happened. A couple, uh, any year ago, we received a probably $200,000 worth of million dollars of watermelon coming from a country which had no proper documentation. A person or basically a different group of farmers, they're putting their effort, they're putting their investment into your Come business, what happened to my... which is supplying of watermelon. Right and hey. and with no proper with no proper documentation, uh, basically that order mailing is useless. Right, you don't want to be in that position where you are sending your effort, you're sending your produce into any market, and that produce is returned back to your country. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a cost, and you can only avoid those costs with your planning. Mm -hmm. Go to a freight for uh, go to agencies who can help you out. Great advice. Thank you so much, guys. Um, Richard, you've got your hand raised there. Do you want to pop your um, picture? Yeah, just, mic on? Just, just a quick one. Thanks, thanks, Barb and Gautam, and well done. Good presentation, and I, I'm mindful of time, but I know some other people raised a few other uh, questions in there around um, getting EIF's details and sharing slides and all that sort of stuff. Um, but but just a very quick question for you, Gautam. Um, you mentioned before that you're currently uh, – uh, moving around about ten containers in every week at the moment. Yeah. What 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 sort of, how, how do you see those numbers playing out moving forward, especially over the second half of the year? We're happy to get twenty now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going up for sure. Uh, we mm -hmm. like I said, we started with a couple of containers. Now we're doing ten, uh, and coming into winter, like Barbara said, winter people like eating. And with our Pacific community, there's a heaps of Pacific people in New Zealand, which means uh, the demand is always there. Uh, and this goes into both formal market and informal market at the moment. But informal market is quite large. The reason why, because they're getting at a cheaper price. Uh, and the only disadvantage is that there's no consistent supply. Right? So that's where a lot of buyers from New Zealand do not focus on Pacific food is because they are not consistent with the supply. Mm, right? so, true. Mm. so if if you are looking to be one of the suppliers in New Zealand market, please rethink. You have to be consistent because no business wants to get engaged with you if you're not able to supply on time. We will not lose our customers because you overpromised. You only can supply for three months and after three months you are lost somewhere and you come back when you have your produce back. No? So the numbers are going up. Uh, there's a lot of players coming in the market, and we see the numbers increasing every now and then. Mm -hmm. and, and and just the last point, if, excuse me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that you guys, or in the past, you've provided um, services around, for example, like training or workshops. I know that um, some of the listeners here today from some of the chambers, for example, that sort of thing could be of interest. So uh, that, that, that's the kind of thing that you do as well? Yes, so uh, EIF is one of the, um, so we, we have approved MPI facility, uh, which I've spoken before. We are an ITF approved facility and uh, our customs, we call it uh, CCA. So what we do is we work with 
uh, local uh, ministries such as uh, MPIs, biosecurity, and we run workshops for exporters and importers with different agencies and happy to help if anyone is uh, willing to get some help from EI International. Yep. Oh, that's great. No, and thank you. Thank you so much. I think, um, you know, what you've really highlighted for me to, today, Gautam, is that that supply chain or that value chain is really quite complex. And, you know, having good intermediaries, having good agents or freight forwarders, that can make all the difference between, you know, making a profitable, uh, having a profitable exporting produ product or making a huge loss because you've not understood the whole process. Process. Right? That's great. So training, yeah. learning, um, understanding what we've been through today in a very quick way. Um, is absolutely critical. So thank you for sharing your knowledge and and uh, and expertise on that. Um, it's been really great hearing that. Now, um, go to my. I know you're happy to to receive emails. You you you've said that. So your email address is up there on the slide. Now we've also got TIF's uh, details on the slide as well there. So if um, if people do want to contact you, you I know you've said that you're very welcome. Um, welcoming of that. Uh, so also look out for the BLP export readiness tool, which will soon be available on BLP's um, portal. And um, PT and I uh, and the Pharma Plus um, program have also got some interesting resources. So do um, do uh, check those out as well. Um, now before we uh, before people drop off, perhaps I can just ask our participants to give us a little bit of feedback on today's webinar. Um, I think Smith is going to post a link to a very very short um, survey, uh, so that will be in the chat box now. It is very short; it's just got six or seven questions, um, and we do invite you to tell us uh, what other topics you'd like us to cover in this series. Um, of course, our next webinar will be in another month's time, so that's Thursday. Um, oh, I'm not quite sure what the date is, but that'll be in August, um, and uh, it's usually the second Thursday of the month. Um, but that now concludes our webinar for today. So um, thank you, Tomas, Malawa Pito, Fafatai Lava, Vinaka, Metaki Mayata, and uh, yeah, thank you very much, Gautam, for sharing oh. all your expertise. Um, yes. Look forward to seeing you all again next month. Matewa. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Gautam. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Please don't forget the survey. <laughs>